Wow, folks, if you haven't been touched, you're dead. And there is no reason under God's sun, moon, and stars why two hours from now Facebook doesn't light up with pictures and words and sentiments about worship this morning. If, if it doesn't, I'm going to call you all on the carpet. Good to be in worship. Our God is an awesome God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the talents you give us. Thank you for Doris's reminding us through the singing of her fingers, that you are an awesome God. Thank you for this worship, Lord. And Lord, as we open your word this morning, remind us again of how awesome you are because of what you've done, what you are doing, and what you continue to do and will do in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to have the Wayfinders with us. Hey, Wayfinders, everybody here, wave, Wayfinders. All right, good to have you guys here with us today. Glad you're here sharing this time with us. Hi, buddy. Quick review. We've been reviewing all for the last two months as we start out. Quick review. Our vision is to... <laughs> that was really bad. That was, that was really sorry. <laughs> Our vision is to... Thank you, that's... That... Wow, thank you. All right. Our mission is to share Jesus. We looked at that the last two weeks, sharing Jesus. He's called us to the mission that he had, to seek and save the lost. And today we're going to start to look at our passion is to love like Jesus. And so that's, that's where we're headed this morning. I'll remind you that our vision, mission, and passion are not just something we've made up out of the blue. But they come out of the vision of Jesus, the mission of Jesus, and the passion of Jesus. Jesus' vision was to do the Father's will, from John 6, chapter, or chapter 6, verse 38. The mission of Jesus, from Luke 19, is to seek and to save the lost. Out of that, we have our mission, to share Jesus so he can continue to seek and to save the lost. And then our passion, his passion, was his church. He loved the church and gave himself for her. And that's what our passion is. Our passion then is to love like Jesus. That's the passion that he's given to us. So that all comes out of his vision and mission and passion. Today we'll look at our passion to love like Jesus. And we will see how the Bible urges us to live our passion, living our passion this morning. So if you have your Bible, everybody got your Bible in any way, form, shape you have it, electronically, paper, papyrus scrolls stone tablets, whatever you have, open with me to John chapter 13. And hopefully you bring your Bible with you to church. It's kind of like going to Dunkin' Donuts without a dollar. Some of you got it. Some of you, it's just, you know. Bring your Bible with you to church as you come. In John chapter 13, I'm going to read uh, two verses here. We're going to look at them a little closer. Uh, verses 34 and 35. This is Jesus speaking. And Jesus says these words in John chapter 13, 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Here, Jesus gave this commandment, if you will, to his disciples. Now the setting is the Last Supper. It's him gathered around the table with his disciples. The immediate setting is that Judas has just left. Jesus has called him out. He's taken off. And so Jesus begins to talk to his disciples in verse 31. Now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified, God will also glorify him to himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews... Where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. There are tens of thousands of things that Jesus could have said to his disciples in that moment. He could have said, go out and start Wrightsdale Baptist Church and form committees and form ministries. He could have said all those, but he didn't. What did he say to them? I have a commandment to you. Now when they hear commandment, they're thinking this word, oh, God gave us 12 com or 10 commandments, and, 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 and now Jesus is giving us a new commandment. 
And his new commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you, you love. By this the world will know that you are my followers because you have love one for another. That's what he said. Jesus would, would later fill this out a little bit more as he talked with them. Go over with me to John 15. Just skip over a chapter or two. John 15, he, he, he kind of expounds on what he means by that love. John 15, verse 9, As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Oh, let me stop there for a minute. Joy. Joy. That's better. Joy is, is a smile he puts, not just on our face, but in our heart. This joy I have given to you, I have spoken this joy to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. He goes on in verse 12. This is my commandment. This is what he says. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from the Father I have made known to you. Now, now notice that. Jesus says, and he's going to show in just a few hours what that means, because he's going to give his life for his friends. But he says, a greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then he turns around and says, you are my friends. I no longer call you servants. You are my friends. And so Jesus is saying, the new commandment is you love one another. How do you love one another? By giving yourself, and I'm going to show you exactly what that means. And he goes to the cross in just a few hours and dies on the cross for his friends. For the sins of the world. And so here the passion of Jesus. The passion of Jesus was the love of God's people for one another. The first followers of Jesus understood this. Or at least they had this tenet of their faith. Those first followers as they began to go out into the world. Understood that they had a responsibility to love like Jesus loved. Over in Ephesians chapter 5. We read those great words about what it means to be married. Wives, submit to your husbands. Amen? And, 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 and none of the men said amen because they know they're sitting beside their wives. The whole context of that is this. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the, also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. You see, we talk about the husband loving his wife, but that whole context is about Jesus loving his church. Here, the passion of Jesus was his church. The passion of Jesus was to die for her, to die for us. We are called, catch this now, to be Jesus. Who? Heard that somewhere before. We are called to be Jesus, and Jesus gave himself for the church. So now, what's it mean to love like Jesus? I want to read a passage of Scripture to you. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture, and as soon as I begin to read it, you will think about the context in which you almost every time hear this passage of Scripture. You very rarely hear it any other place, but you hear it in one context almost every time you're in that context, you hear this passage of Scripture. I'm going to read it, and as soon as I start reading it, you'll know, and then I'm going to ask you, so this should be a test that is very, very, very simple. Paul writes, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have not love. I am a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. 
is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, what's the context you always hear this in? A wedding. You go to a wedding, somebody somewhere is going to either read that passage, a portion of that passage, or allude to that passage. And so we get the thinking that this passage was placed smack dab in the middle of the Bible so we'd have something to read at weddings. Well, is that right? Well, the passage does deal with love, but do you know why the passage was written? Look over in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The end of that, of that chapter, verses 23 through 34, is Paul sharing with the church in Corinth about the Lord's Supper. He says that he had uh, received from the Lord, which he also delivered, that, that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he, gave it th- he, he broke it, gave thanks, said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Same manner he took the cup. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. And then he reminds the church that they should not eat of the Lord's Supper and drink of the Lord's Supper unworthily. So they need to examine themselves and look to see where their heart was as they came to worship. Then you bump into chapter 12. Chapter 12 begins, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. He goes on to a long discussion about spiritual gifts. Verse 4, there are a diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. A differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Uh, he goes on in verse 8, for one is a word of wisdom through the spirit, another word of knowledge, another word of faith, another gifts of healing. And so he talks about the gifts that God gives the church. Did I say the church? The church to do the ministry. Verses 12 and following in chapter 12. For as the body is one, it has many members, but all the members of that one body being member are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, just like we saw this morning. Whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. He goes on to talk about the foot and the hand and the ear and how all of the body members work together. So in verse 28, God has appointed these as apostles and prophets and teachers miracles and healings and administrations and helps all of these all of these are given to the church so the church can be the church working together in unity in their diversity that my friends is the context of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians it's not a context about weddings it's about the church being the church so If you keep that in mind, that this is the context, and if you really want to know how to love like Jesus, listen to this passage of Scripture again. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but have not love for my fellow church members, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love for my fellow church members, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love for my fellow church members, it profits me nothing. Love for my fellow church members suffers long and is kind. Love for my fellow church members does not envy. Love for my fellow church members does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love for my fellow church members never fails. In verse 13, now abide faith, hope, love these three, but the greatest of these is love 
for my fellow church members. Do you get it? That's the context. That's how, why that passage was written. It wasn't written so that we'd have something nice to say at weddings or something to memorize so when we think about love, it was written in the context of Paul wanting the church at Corinth to be the church that loved like Jesus. That's the whole thing. Now hope, abide hope, faith, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love for each other. With all this from Scripture about the passion of Jesus And the call of our passion, what does it mean, especially in line with our vision and mission, to have the passion to love like Jesus? Well, consider this. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Then he goes on to paint a picture. He says, It is like precious oil upon the beard, upon the head running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down to the edges of his garment, like the dew of Hermon descending on the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, live life forevermore. How great it is, the psalmist said, when we dwell together in unity as his church. One way to be united, a great place to start, and a staying place is to be together. Listen, don't turn here. But listen, you want to write down the the passage? It's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Listen to this. Therefore, brethren, have the boldness to enter the holiness by by the blood of Jesus and by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. Listen, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, grab this. Grab a hold of verse 23 and following. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. You want to love like Jesus? Then you need to spend time together with God's people, loving one another. We must spend time together, foregoing other good things to be together for His sake and for His passion for us. Also, let me ask you the question. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, who are you going to spend eternity with? Quick answer is Jesus. Who are the rest of the people you're going to spend eternity with? Look around, folks. You're going to spend a lot of time together in eternity. I know it's a ways out there for most of us. Maybe not for some, who knows. But the reality is that we are saved, we are called to live together, to serve together, to worship together, to minister together, to grow together, to raise our families together, and ultimately spend eternity together. So it's important that we spend time together here. But what the reality is, we often find any reason to do just about anything but spend time together here. What is often the first thing we cut out when our schedules get busy? Hmm, rhetorical question. You see, we, we can find a lot of other good things to do. And, and it gets interesting when you talk to people about that because... In the same conversation, you can talk with people about how rotten our society is and how rotten the world is and all the bad influences they're giving to their kids and all the bad stuff that's going on, and yet we turn right around and we grab all the toys and all the experiences and all the entertainment that we can from the world and expect it to be okay, but I want my kids to be able to adjust. Adjust to what? A messed up world that you've already said is messed up? What do we spend our time with? first thing we cut back why do we have to beg and fret and constantly look for people to help in the ministries of his church and the reason is that because our passion for each other is not a priority why is it that oftentimes when we come to church someone either says to me or lets me know in one way or the other that somebody or another is quitting a job or ministry in the church and we can't find someone to do it because our passion for each other is not a priority Let me drop the other shoe. 
Our passion for each other is a direct indicator of our passion for Jesus. Hear me now. Lest you say I said something else, our passion for each other is a direct indicator of our passion for Jesus. Because he said, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not my words, his words. If you love one another, you show that you are a follower of Jesus, that you love him. I've said this twice before. Let me say it a third time for emphasis. If we don't get this right, all the rest of our vision and our mission has no credibility. We want to be Jesus, and that starts with loving each other. We want to share Jesus, and others must see us loving each other that gives us the right to share Jesus. We want to love like Jesus, and it starts with us loving each other. Let me get very personal right now. Kathy and I, know that you love us deeply. We, we have felt that. We know that you love us. In the last three and a half years, you've supported us and loved us. The last several months, you've been over and above the love you shared with us, and we are thankful for that. We love you, and we know that you love us. And I know it's floating around there, but I'm okay. I may be a little off in the brain, but I'm okay. However, and hear my heart here, I would trade all of your love and all of your support and all of your care for us if that's what it takes for Wrightsdale Baptist Church to be known as the place where people love each other so passionately that others want to see Jesus through you. I would give, I'd empty my bank account, sell my car, get all three dollars for it. Whatever it takes, if that's what it took for this church to be so passionate for each other, so loving to each other that the world would say, that Wrightsdale bunch, they're crazy because they love each other. That's the passion he calls us to. It's a passion that put Jesus on the cross. And that's the kind of passion he calls us to, to love each other that much. This is not said for direct or dramatic effect or to point to me. We must get this right. To love like Jesus means we must love each other. I remind you again what he said, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He didn't qualify it. He didn't say love one another if the other person acts right or you agree with him. He didn't say love one another when that ministry is going exactly the way you think it should go, but if it takes a turn, forget about it. But no, this is what we hear. Well, preacher, you don't know what he said to me. Or, preacher, you don't know how she treated me. Or, I was told this, not that. Or, I wasn't told that. Okay. Okay. You've been hurt by what someone said or did. I get that. It happens when, as I said last week, it gets messy because we deal with people. However, and hear 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 me clearly, the other person or the situation that you find yourself in that pulls you away from the fellowship of the church is not the measure of your love. The measure of your love is Jesus. His love for you and the church. That's the measure. It's not how well people like you or work in your ministry or smile or, 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 or don't argue with you. That's not the measure. The measure is His command to us. The measure is His giving Himself for us. His measure is the new command that we love one another. That means to forgive as He forgave and as He forgives us. Love here is all-encompassing. It's all-forgiving. It's all-inclusive. Now, Kathy will tell you, I don't get riled up by much. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a passionate guy in certain things, but I, I'm pretty even keel. I don't get riled up by much. But i got to tell you, I do get riled up about His church. It is His way to reach the world. And we want to show His love for the world by how we love and forgive each other. If you want to get me riled up, start picking on the church and we'll, we'll have a fight. I know the church isn't perfect. The church has never been perfect since the very first day it started because it has people in it. I know that. But you get me riled up, start picking on my church in particular or the church in general. Because it is still the bride of Christ. If you're going to kick somebody's bride, don't kick my Savior's bride. 
Well, I'm going to get riled up, and I'm going to get in your face about it, as I am right now. The passion of Jesus is his church. And he calls that passion to us, that passion to be his church. So what do we do about it? Well, first of all, come. Come to Jesus. Come to the place that he says, I put on earth that you can live and love and serve and grow. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Every one of those young people who came into that baptistry this morning, you remember the question I asked them? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And every one of them said yes. We don't baptize someone unless we know that they are a follower, a believer of Jesus Christ. Have you done that? If I were to ask you that question this morning, get you in the hallway and say, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, what would you say? Well, I'm not sure. Wrong answer. Because he gives assurance when we say yes. Have you been baptized? We have the baptistry full. I want to baptize next Sunday. And, and at the end of the service here, if you're interested in baptism, I want you to come down. I'm going to stay here instead of being at the back door. Kathy will be back there to greet you, but I'm going to stay right here. If you're interested in baptism, I want you to come down here during the invitation, sit on the front row, and after the service is over, we're going to talk about baptism. Because we got water in that baptism, in that baptistry. And there's no reason why we can't keep baptism, baptizing people. So I call you to do that this morning. If you're interested in baptism, come down this morning, and we'll talk, and we'll, and we'll share about what that means. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come this morning. Come right where you are. It's very simple. You don't have to have a special set of words. It says simply saying, Jesus, I believe that you lived for me, you died for me, and you forgive my sins. Come. He'll come into your heart today. My friends, if you are a believer, will you come and pray and seek others to pray for the unity and the love of God's people for one another? Do you want to be that church that the community says they love each other with a passion because they love Jesus? And come and pray. There's some people you need to pray for. There's some situations you need to pray through in your own life and your own relationships to some people in this church to open up that love and watch God move. Come. Come this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we have this special time of invitation, it's special because you're here and you're moving in hearts, Lord. Lord, there's someone here this morning who right now the Holy Spirit is saying in their heart, you need to accept Jesus. You need to settle that issue about your eternity. And Lord, I pray right now that that person will pray, dear Jesus, forgive me and come into my heart. But I also pray for those of us, Father, who, who are believers and may have some, some roadblocks between us and some other people. That we'll get on our knees this morning, Father, and work it out and go to that person. Whether we're wronged or we're the ones that did the wronging. And show the love of Christ. Lord, move among us during this time in Jesus' name. Amen. This invitation points to the cross. Because that's Jesus' example of his love for you. There's room at the cross for you if you'll come. Let's stand together. And you may come. upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide and its grace so free is sufficient for me and deep is its fountain and wide as there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross. 
before we sing the next verse, go ahead and continue to play, Doris. These are coming to pray at the altar. You may want special prayer this morning for something, and that's why I'm here. If you'd like to come and we can pray together, not that I'm anything special, but we together in the power of the Spirit can come and pray together. So you may come this morning and we'll pray together. You may come to the altar and do what God has led you to do. As we sing, you may come. The second verse. Though millions have found him a friend And have turned from the sins they have sinned The Savior still waits to open the gates And welcome a sinner before you There's room at the cross. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room. bow your heads please and Doris is going to continue to play because the spirit's moving among his people and this is a special time for you right here right now to work out some things between you and the Lord between you and a brother or sister in Christ will you do that this morning Lord's continuing to speak to hearts. I'll take a little extra time now for you to listen to the Holy Spirit as He's speaking to you. That voice inside of you that's saying, I've got to work some things through. I want to have a love like that in my life. I want a love like that in my life. But I can't do it on my own. Today, right now, will you turn it over to Jesus? You recognize that that he can do that in you and in us if we're willing right here and right now just take an extra moment I know we're going into extra time but it's okay just take a moment If you'll raise your heads, please. These are continuing to pray here. Um, a couple of things, and then we're going to dismiss. The deacons have come up to show support for their pastor, and I appreciate that. They've come 
They've been praying here, and uh, they're, they're a good group of men who, who honestly, honestly, I know their heart, they want this church to be the love beacon in this community. So thank you for their support. These are going to continue to pray. We're going to dismiss in just a moment, and the others are going to continue to pray here. That's okay. Again, if you're interested in baptism, I'm going to be right down here. I want you to come down, and, and we'll talk about baptism next Sunday. I don't care if you're 10 years old or 200 years old. You may come this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the movement of your spirit among us, Father. Thank you that, that we are a church united. We're not a church perfect. We are a church that's seeking to be the love of Jesus in our community. It, it happens when we do it individually, but collectively, as we love each other, we love you. So go with us now as we open your word in Sunday school, as we live this day and tell the world about Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.